evening and welcome to today's Master Gardener program about building a backyard bird oasis. I'm Dina Henschen, Head of Adult Services at Percival Library and your host today. Please feel free to send me your comments and questions during the program by using the chat feature and I will relay them to Eileen during the question and answer period at the end of the program. Eileen Boyle is the former Director of Conservation and Research at Mount Cuba Center. She also served as Director of Education at MCC creating their program. Previously, she was a professor of horticulture at Mercer College in New Jersey and the director of horticulture at both the Philadelphia Zoo and the New York Botanical Garden. Her career also included being the administrator of Van Cortland and Pelham Bay Park in New York City. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Okay, are you ready to go? All right, so my name is Eileen Boyle, and I've always had um, a great love for the birds and the bees and the butterflies, as well as the flowers. All right, I'm trying to... All right, so I am a horticulturalist and not an ornithologist. I wish I could see all your smiling faces right now, but I'm a plant person and I've spent a lot of time just learning about how plants relate to, um, to our little critters. So I want you to close your eyes and think of yourself as a bird and you're gonna fly in um, to your garden and think about your garden from a bird's eye view and what do the birds need? So that's how you're, you're um, basically going to uh, uh, meet the bird's needs. So are there places for the, our little birds to hide from predators? Think of where in your garden can this bird hide? Are there safe places for it to nest? You want to think about that because Birds have very specific nesting um, uh, requirements depending on what species they are. Um, how about sheltered areas? If a big hurricane comes or uh, a big storm, can they protect themselves and find some, some place to hide in the bad wet weather? Is there food and water? And um, it's gonna be different food for different birds but water is really important. Here's a kingfisher flying over my lake um, and the kingfisher will eat fish and it loves the water, but the water provides a lot more than just water itself. It also provides a pyramid of life of um, different herbivores, eating, you know, other things, feeding the frogs, and then, you know, kind of going up that whole pyramid. So water is a really important thing um, to have for birds in your gardens. So it'll give you those dragonflies and toads and everything that's on that whole um, pyramid of life. So here's my backyard. Yes, I am very lucky. And besides um, inviting, you know, all those little toads and everything that the birds are going to eat, it's also going to give you a whole bunch of different kinds of birds. Not only the ducks and the swans and the and the geese and the egrets and the ibis and all those kinds of critters. It's going to give you um, life itself. So water, water is really important. All right, so say you don't live on a lake. This is also my backyard. Um, and right next to the area that I, I uh, have my food is a little water feature. And you can do this at home to invite um, the birds to your backyard. So all it is is um, kind of a, a basin, a black plastic basin that I dug a hole and then put some rocks around the top and then planted around it. And that little thing that looks kind of like a disc in the middle is a um, recirculating solar uh, uh, pump. So it keeps the water moving and then that way you have no mosquitoes and it keeps down the algae as as well. And I'll, I'll always see little frogs or little birds or something 
you know, sitting off the off the rock. So remember that water is is an important part for your bird gardening. Say you don't want you don't want to you're too busy. You could just get a little bird bath where they can come and and feed. Or if you're really low maintenance, just put a saucer or a dish out there. This is actually something I made out of concrete from a leaf impression, and it fits in nicely with um, with a garden. So in a garden, you really want to imitate nature and you want to think about what birds do I want to attract? And so every animal has a different ecological niche. So the niche is kind of how it makes a living, where it lives and what it eats. And so if you have a specific bird that you want to, you know, get to come to your garden, you need to know these these requirements. And if you're not looking for a specific bird, we're just going to talk about habitats and uh, niches in, in general. So first of all, learn your birds. There's so many good books out there um, and uh, their desired habitats. You know, you want to know where do they want to live so you can invite them. So, you know, everybody knows what a woodland is and lots of trees. You know, that may take you a while to get if you don't have a woodland, but plant some trees. Um, a meadow is more of a grassland. And then a wetland can be either a woodland or a meadow. And if it's a, more of a um, meadow or a grassland, it's called a marsh if it's wet. And if it's standing trees with, with some water, um, that's more of a swamp. Well, you're not gonna have a swamp in your backyard, but you might have a downspout that squirts some water out and makes a wet area. So then you could plant a tree or two, a couple of shrubs and create your little mini habitats. So then thinking about what do they eat? Are they fruits? Are they dry fruits? Are they berries? Are they wet fruits? Um, you know, what are these birds going to eat? And then you want to to um, provide them with that. Insects. A lot of um, birds will eat insects. Here we have our, our little um, uh, bluebird. And especially when it's raising its young, it will collect a lot of caterpillars and insects and bring them back to their young. And then a food for all seasons. So if you're trying to get a ruby throated hummingbird, you have to provide uh, nectar with, with um, different red flowers. And if you want fruits and seeds, you have to ha plan how these things are going to grow in a succession. So you always have something for the, for the birds to eat in a different place. And you can actually grow insects, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So where this, this bird lives and how it operates is what you got to figure out. So let's take the example of, of the bluebird. The bluebird is a cavity nester, so it needs a place to live in a, in a big old tree that it can bore in and, and make its cavity. If you don't have that, um, you, could, you can put up a bird box. And here you see the little birds um, you know, sitting on the top, probably waiting to to eat their, uh, uh, feed their young. And here you see a bluebird on a sumac. So what does a bluebird do after it's had its babies? They're all fledged, they're out. Well, there's no, no, not a lot of um, insects in December. So they'll switch to say a sumac or a juniper or some kind of small dried fruit that's there. So birds eat different things at different times of year. Um, and there are a lot of insectivorous birds. They're really uh, fun to watch. Swallows swooping in and, and going after mosquitoes is always a very pleasant sight. Um, or a Phoebe. A Phoebe is a, is a small insectivorous bird that will go uh, on your porch light and it has a little tail that, that flicks. And I have a funny Phoebe story. When I had just moved into this house at the lake, my husband, it was the first time he was on business and I was by myself and I hear like boom, boom, boom in the front door. And I'm like, ah, so I go get a baseball bat. I come in and I'm like, what's going on? And there was a Phoebe that was swooping around the porch light. And every time the Phoebe swooped, a cat was trying to get it and was banging it into my front door. 
So if you have Phoebes, they'll probably be on your porch light, they'll be around your house, and they'll help um, get rid of all kinds of unwanted insects that um, you don't want, and they do. So you can, uh, by turning on that porch light every once in a while, attract the Phoebe. Though in general, porch lights are not a great thing. Um, I I only do it, you know, when um, for a little bit in the evening. All right, so do you guys know about Dr. Doug Talamay? I wish I could see your smiling faces and see you raise your hand, but I'm just going to talk to myself. So Dr. Doug Talamay, um, good friend of mine, and he wrote the wonderful book, Bringing Nature Home. And it's about native plants and how native plants fit into the ecosystem with the birds and the bees and the butterflies. So how does this work? Well, here's a picture of a big giant white oak tree. And this white oak tree has very specific caterpillars that are associated with it. They only grow on the white oak tree. And it produces many, many, many caterpillars. You know how like, like a species specific example would be uh, milkweeds and how you have the monarchs laying their eggs and growing on the milkweeds and becoming caterpillars and eventually butterflies. Same thing happens on all the native plants. So they all have very species specific um, uh, caterpillar interactions with them. So if you have this white oak tree, you're going to have a lot of different species of caterpillar. Um, Doug found out that it's one of the best trees for growing caterpillars. So I said we could grow plants, we can also grow caterpillars. So if you plant that white oak tree, all these different insects are going to come, lay their eggs, and then produce um, caterpillars. Well, it's actually not just insects, it's moths and, and, and butterflies. But so you have 517 different species of caterpillar produced by that white oak tree. So it's a great thing to plant in your in your backyard. And then you'll get um, uh, acorns as well, which will also feed other kinds of wildlife. Willow is another good one with 456 different species of caterpillar. Birch, um, cherry, poplar, as you can see, those are all good trees to, to grow your caterpillars for, for, your, uh, for your birds. Um, so birds not only have this niche of what they eat, they also have a niche of where exactly they live. And if you have a big giant oak tree, they'll live in different parts of the canopy level. So, for example, a Baltimore Oriole feeds at the top of the tree and will just kind of hop around the, the outside. Um, it will eat insects, fruit, and nectar, and it has a hanging nest that's really beautiful. You've probably seen it once or twice. Um, a chickadee, it looks for food in the outer foliage and hops all around um, with winter berries and seeds, and then it will nest in a cavity. And if you want to know about this black capped chickadee, um, there are a lot of apps out there besides the books. And you can go um, look up Cornell Ornithological, and um, there's all kinds of uh, bird apps and um, that you can click on. And they'll tell you all about the birds, how they live, what they do. And um, it's a really tremendous uh, resource. Also, if you get really good at, at you know, looking at your birds, there's ways that you can be a citizen scientist and go to Cornell and say, I saw these 100 birds in my backyard. And then a certain day um, they have, they collect this data and you upload it to, to Cornell. So Cornell is the place to look if you're interested in um, online birds. They also have an app um, called Merlin and they have other ones on that you can download on your phone that will, if you hear the beep, 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 it'll tell you what it is. So Cornell is a tremendous uh, resource to, to look at. So there's our little chickadee. Um, woodpeckers are also have a different niche in this, in this tree. They move up the tree searching for insects and rotten woods, and, and then they'll eat uh, fruits and seeds, and they also have their little nest cavity thing going on. Um, while they're going up the tree in the same tree, you'll see a nuthatch going down the tree. 
um, and they look for food and um, of spiders, insects, anything they can see on the on the bark, and they also list nest in cavities. So you see why it's really important not to chop down every tree um, that looks like it's it's kind of a little bit in decline. So long as it's not near your house, leave it up, and you'll have all these different um, nesting birds in it. So the point is, there's room for a lot of these uh, many birds. Um, all in in one tree. So become an uh, an observer of nature. Go outside, and if you see a hummingbird at your red tubular flowers, you're successful. If you see a robin pulling a worm from the the lawn, you you've got something going there. So um, go and observe in your your yard, and that's how you learn a lot about birds. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about invasive species because there's that you can maybe plant a Japanese maple if you really want, but you might as well just put a statue in the backyard because it's not going to produce any caterpillars because you don't have that native association with the insects and it's going to kind of crowd out some of the other good guys. So here's a cedar wax wing on the top of a shrub. And this is an Amur honeysuckle. Amur is from a, a river in China, and it came over here. It's very ornamental, has these great berries, and the birds eat them up, poop them out, and they're everywhere. So they're out competing all our good stuff that will produce more of um, the insects and the caterpillars that, that we want. So there's really a very good reason to not plant um, non-natives, especially if they are invasive and they'll get out of control. So here's a cedar waxwing on a native cedar plant, and that's what it really wants. The seed is the appropriate size, and it's it will spread these seeds, but that's a good thing because then you'll have um, uh, juniper, native cedars, junipers everywhere. Um, so you want to see how these different birds interact. So you might see the bluebird hovering near where the the cedar waxwing was, going after the bugs that, that the cedar waxwing has kind of stirred up. And then down lower, you might see a wren searching for insects hiding in the lower shrubs because they all, like I said, have this um, hierarchy where they are. And then here's a little towhee that you'll see scratching in the in, in the leaf litter, kind of where you'd find sparrows and other um, ground birds. All right, so here's a indigo bunting eating a seed. So to feed or not to feed? Um, we feed not really to help the birds, but to attract them to our life so that we can see them. And if you are a good scientist and you keep your feeder, um, you know, clean and you learn about avian flu and see, oh, is avian flu coming out? I'll take my feeder down because I don't want to spread that around. But if you're a good citizen, there's nothing really wrong with, with uh, putting up bird feeders, but you have to maintain them. You have to keep them clean. Um, and then you can enjoy that. Put them close to the house so you can, you know, watch your birds and and enjoy it but especially hummingbird feeders you have to when it's warm um you know keep it keep it clean and um you know hygiene is most important if you decide to to feed the birds nesting boxes um you can put up nesting boxes for wood ducks and owls and bluebirds even even um for bats and what they're basically doing is providing the cavity that if you don't have trees that are big enough, um, you know, you can provide habitat um, for for these um, nesters. So my husband built a lovely a wood duck, wood duck, wood duck box. And you have to do like a, a hole of a certain size and you can go online and learn all about the different size of the holes because if it's too small or too big, they won't go in there. Um, and we put it down by our lake and every year for 17 years, the wood ducks come, 
The male sits on top, just like the picture. The female goes in, she looks around, she stays there for an hour, then she flies away and says, honey, we're finding another apartment. We don't like it here. So it may or may not work, but we get to watch the wood ducks, so it's okay. And if you have enough big trees, you don't really need it. Because here's what the wood ducks do. They, they get their little hole in the cavity of a big tree, and I've actually been on my kayak on the lake watching the mother duck push the wood ducks out of the nest when they're big enough and they just plop in the water and off they go. Big happy family. So, you know, it's it's really up to you if you want to try um, uh, uh, a wood duck box or not. Um, but you need to provide them with shelter. So evergreens are a wonderful shelter for for most um, birds, especially if there's a big hawk going after them, they'll all go hide in the in the evergreen tree. And you could do pines or spruces or firs or um, you know arborvitae, whatever whatever you like. Um, it's a good place for them to hide. Also, vines are a wonderful place because they can get in under the vines and and get some protection. And um, a lot of the vines, like this one, uh, Parthenocissus, will provide um, great uh, food for the birds. And caterpillars, you know, will eat on it as well. And then the birds have two meals. Grasses are really important food for for birds and 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 their habitat and they provide both food and cover. And so here's an example of little blue stem, which is a wonderful uh, kind of short grass for your garden that will provide a little, um, uh, the little hairy seeds that the birds like to eat. And then um, the ground birds will, will uh, go underneath and, and get their cover. Things it, like bob whites, if you want those, you need eight acres of of grass so not every bird will will come but in general if you know what you're doing and you build it they will come you also need a large enough area for nesting pairs and uh, these are uh, uh, yellow bellied fly catchers and i have them in the backyard they're really cool but they need um, certain nesting materials, a big enough place to, to live in my big old, old oak tree, and lots of bugs, which they have, and then they're very happy. So plans for nesting. This is a list that I took um, from, a, from a bird book. Now, the problem is the birds haven't always read the book. So, you know, our dog was always vireos and tangers. I've seen them nesting. Yes, indeed. But any of these these uh, these kinds of, of trees, hawthorns are kind of um, they have little thorns sticking up and the, the birds will nest because they feel kind of protected. Hollies are are good because they're evergreen and the birds can kind of hide in them as well as as uh, get some fruit. Junipers uh, are great. Pines, oaks, roses, blackberries, elderberries, hemlocks. Frankly, I don't think there is a plant that is bad for nesting because it's going to attract a different kind of bird. So if you particularly want a vireo, plant a dogwood, but um, you don't have to really worry too much about this list. So fruits and and birds are very interconnected. And I love this Tobias uh, Stranover still life just to kind of illustrate um, how you have to think about it. So birds and fruit. There are all kinds of different fruit. There are wet fruit that like a berry, which like a blueberry, a palm is like a little apple, a droop is a little cherry. Birds love them all. I grow cherries in my backyard. The birds get the cherries before I do. So they love wet fruit, depending on the time of the year. They also like dry fruit, like seed heads off a sunflower or grasses like we talked about, little beans, um, things that split open, Samara, which is like a double seeded uh, winged uh, fruit like you would see on a maple tree. All of these provide great uh, fruit for for your birds but you want as many different kinds as you possibly can and then you'll have all kinds of birds in your backyard 
And like I said before, they eat different things in different seasons. So right now, the Sambucus, the elderberry um, on the lake is, is really out. It likes kind of a, a wetter side, but you could grow that, like I said, in your downspout or in a wet part of, of your backyard. Um, spice bush is also out right now with the little red berries. Um, more in the fall, you might have your dogwoods or your viburnums. And then in the winter, you have the fruit that nobody has eaten. So it may not be the tastiest fruit, but it's the most persistent fruit. So things like junipers and hollies, um, once it gets cold and there's snow on the ground, they'll go for those particular kinds of, of fruit. They can also switch from insects to fruit to seed in the winter uh, as, as they need. Like I said, when they're having their babies, they go for the insects more because it's more of a high protein diet. And then later in the season, as they're migrating, they go to, to different kinds of, of fruit. So, you know, growing a native uh, wildflower garden with grasses, making a meadow is a great place to start. You don't have to mow your lawn. You can just kill off the grass and, and um, do some plugs and get a really nice meadow going pretty fast. So here's a turkey. When I was doing my graduate work, I had this professor that was, he was a turkey man. And so he would go study the turkeys. Occasionally he would go kill them, bring them in so he could study their um, metabolism and, and, you know, their organs and such. And he would bring me the stomach and I did it like that. But he'd say, Eileen, grow out in the greenhouse all of what's in this turkey's stomach. And here's what I found. Turkeys eat acorns, specifically white oak, and corms, the little corms of spring beauty, the, um, the spring ephemeral that comes out early in the season. So they scratch with their claws and they eat them all up. So that's what turkey eats. So if you want a turkey, plant uh, spring beauty and, and a white oak. The other thing to do, don't just plant one little plant. It's going to look weird to start with. Grouping plants always attract more birds. It's more visually pleasing. Um, and, and then that way, if one blooms one week and you get fruit a little later and this one blooms a little later, you're, you're creating that successional planting um, that'll really help you out. All right, so like I said, the fall berries for migration are really, really important for birds because they, some of them go, you know, to South America. And um, here's Parthenocystis quinquefolia, the Virginia creeper, and that's why they call it Ivy League. This is what grows on, on the Ivy League buildings. But it gets this really cool little blue fruit that the, um, the birds go crazy on. And another important uh, uh, food for birds is poison ivy. Now, am I saying plant poison ivy? No, but maybe if you have a big, you know, bunch of trees that aren't near your house, you could leave it because those little white berries, berries of white, run, take flight. Um, so you don't touch the, the poison ivy or uh, leaves of three, let it be, or hairy rope, don't be a dope. <laughs> you don't want to touch it. But the birds can. They love it. And this is migratory food that has a lot of calories to, to fuel them to wherever they're going. So um, before you rip something out, you know, think about, can I, can I leave it? If you have a small little garden and it's growing up one tree, it's going to be everywhere in your garden. So in that case, you can get rid of it. But just know that all of these different um, native vines and and different things that you might say oh i don't want that in my garden might be fueling the birds so poison ivy hairy rope don't be a dope but maybe you could leave the seeds all right the other thing you need to to use this is my backyard um is organic practices because if you're putting a bunch of pesticides on your on your lawn it's not good for the birds it's they're gonna go we're look at our our little robin here he's gonna try to get um you know a nice little worm and and you know he's not gonna eat something that's good for him so i actually 
do all my lawn with worm compost. I have a worm compost bin in my house that I've had for actually 17 years. And I just throw my leftover stuff in it. And then twice a year, I move the worms aside, pull out the compost, chuck it on my lawn, overseed it. And I have a lawn that looks like this. And the robins love it. And it's full of worms. And it's a happy place for birds and my granddaughter and anybody who wants to roll down the grass. So some natives might be hard to find or hard to propagate. So we get to this kind of uh, moral question, can I collect seeds? Well, if go to your friend's house. If they have what you like, ask them if you can collect the seeds and if that would be great. When in the wild, if it's something that has fallen on the ground and, um, you know, it's a public park, you probably could collect a seed or two. But if you do more than that, you have to get permission. You can go to ask permission and say, please let me, you know, um, get these uh, these different seeds. But I collected um, a sassafras from a seed from a friend of mine and I planted it and up came a sassafras. So it, if you do collect seeds, it, it does work. Um, so I've given a handout and um, the handout are, it, are plants that are great bird plants, but they're mostly woody plants and they should be visually interesting. They're easy to grow and they're available. Some of them are cultivars, because there's nothing wrong with the cultivar, it's just a man-made selection, or some of them are straight species. Now, do you need to use the cultivars? No, but cultivars are a known entity, and sometimes it's the, the only thing that uh, you can get from a garden center. So when I'm talking about a cultivar, you don't have to necessarily use, use it, you can just use the straight species, but these are ones that are tried and true that I have personally grown and know to be fabulous for your garden and the birds. Um, but I have left out a whole perennial class. So black-eyed Susans and coflowers and goldenrod and all those herbaceous plants are really great for birds. So you want to plant them too, but I only got an hour, so can't do it. Um, so here, you know, here's a little goldfinch on um, coneflowers, and you can find a lot online. Now, Cuba Center, where I used to work, has a whole trial garden where it says, oh, these are the best coneflowers, these are uh, the best flocks, these are the best, you know, and we trial them, and then it puts out a report. So you can find out a lot by just going online and looking to see what kind of plants are the best. All right, so I'm just going to talk about woody plants. And I'm about halfway through. That's good. All right. So I'm going to use genus and species because you're a bunch of gardeners. So it's good good to practice. And when we see Amelanchier ex grandiflora, that's Amelanchier is the genus. Grandiflora is the species. And when you see something like X, it means it's a hybrid between two species. Then you see autumn brilliance in its little quotes. That means it's a cultivar. It means it's a man-made selection that either somebody has found it or they've made a cross um, and it's a wonderful plant. Okay, so this is called a service berry and I won't, it's not a nice reason that they call it a service berry. It's because it comes out just when the ground stops to stops freezing so they used to bury their dead at just when this came out um it's called autumn brilliance service berry and um it's a wonderful little plant it's got it's a shrub maybe three feet tall the fruit is a palm which means it's like a little apple and this thing attracts 19 different species of birds Woodpeckers and wood thrush and road best road breasted grosbeaks and vireos and all kinds of stuff. So this is a great plant for um, kind of a moist site. There's our rose breasted grosbeak. 
um, and and there's a, a little goldfinch. So you can see what happens with the with the poems. With the, it, it it starts like kind of lighter. It gets a red, and then it turns like a dark purple. And you can even make jam out of this yourself. It's very tasty. Kind of tastes like a blueberry, but it does have a few seeds. So you might want to put it through a sieve. Um, it has white beautiful like rosaceous flowers it's also called shad bush which i think is nicer than service berry because it blooms when the shad go up the river so there's a lot of associations with this with this bush um and and amelanchier canadensis is a uh, straight species and uh you know you'll find it growing growing in the woods but it likes a little bit it, shady wet site blooms in the spring and here's the fall color on the one that i showed you before the autumn brilliance beautiful kind of coppery uh, golden fall color really nice plant um it's native all up and down the whole east coast so you will have no no trouble whatsoever growing this if you put the right plant in the right place so it likes um, not a dry, not high and dry and rocky, but more like, um, you know, along a lake by a stream bed, that kind of wet, moist, shady woodland kind of thing. Um, okay, so that was number one. Here comes Aronia arbutifolia, or the red chokeberry. It's called the chokeberry because if I ate it, I'd probably go, <laughs> it doesn't taste very good to me. But this is one that persists on the bush that they will eat later on in the winter time. And there's Aronia arbutifolia, which is a red one. There's also Melanocarpa, which is a black one. I call these like the Walmart parking lot plants. You cannot kill this sucker. It grows about two to three feet tall. Um, lovely kind of pinkish reddish fall color, little white flowers. It's a workhorse. And um, it's really good for partial sun to tough conditions. It's, it's really a, a good little plant. Here's the, um, again, similar little white rosaceous um, kind of, of, of flowers. And a red palm is, is, its, um, is its fruit. And 12 different species eat it. And like I said, it lasts, it's one of those ones that, that persists. Um, and here's a cardinal eating the black chokeberry, the Aronia melocarpa. Up and down the whole East Coast, you can even grow it in Texas, so it must be tough. Pawpaw. Does anybody know pawpaw way down yonder in the pawpaw patch? Um, I planted one of these and I waited and I waited and I waited and it did nothing for like literally seven years. Then overnight it formed a thicket. It started coming up and coming up and coming up. And it's got these really cool little buds that then open into these beautiful kind of um, flesh color flowers. And it actually does attract flies because... Um, I guess that must be their pollinator. But the pawpaw produces this amazing, like custard apple, um, like large fruits in the, they're just starting right about now. So it's like September, late, middle September, and they taste great and the birds like them too. Um, so it's, it's an interesting uh, plant, it don't, Put it where there's not a lot of room because you can, like, you know, hide your neighbors from across the street. But it might take a couple of years for it to all come up. Um, very common on the Delmarva Peninsula. And, um, you know, it also will uh, make caterpillars that the birds will eat. And here's the pawpaws. It also, the caterpillars um, that it makes are, one of them is uh, the zebra swallowtail. So that's kind of cool to have in your backyard too. Um, underneath my sassafras, this plant miraculously came. And it's an example of the bird eating some of the American beauty berry somewhere else, sitting up in the tree, down it came out of the tree. And now I have American beauty berry. And they're these small little purple um, bunches, almost like little grape bunches, 
that are out right now and they're fabulous the birds go crazy over them um it's it's a, a small to medium shrub maybe you know four or five feet tall i've seen them as high as six but good for 12 different species of birds including the northern bobwhite um, but it's this little berry-like droop that is just the best color you ever saw. And it, it goes nicely under a, a small tree like a dogwood or, or a sassafras. And um, small birds like to, to eat, the, eat the fruit. So a lot of the warblers really, really like it, which is kind of cool. This is a black-throated blue warbler. This is a more southern species, so if you're going to move to Maine, it may not do good, but it definitely will do good in in um, our area. And, you know, with global warming, we're going to get more and more southern species that we're able to plant. Cyanthus virginicus. Cyanthus means snow flower because when it's in flower, this is what it looks like. It's a, a big shrub to small tree. It's, it's bigger than me, maybe six foot tall, um, and it's called the fringe tree. And um, I particularly like it because of the fruits that it gets. Now, I'm gonna talk about plant sex. The way the plants work is in a perfect world or a perfect flower you have the male and the female parts in the same kind of uh, uh all in one place like you would on a tulip however <clears throat> it's not that simple sometimes plants are monoecious which mean they have male flowers and females on the same plant and sometimes they're dioecious which means they're divorced so you got a male plant and a female plant and you need both to to make the fruit so the trick on this one is you need more than one plant and you need a male plant and a female plant and that's called dioecious polygamo dioecious means like you can't figure it out it could be a male it could be a female it could be both it's a little confused but look at the fruit that it, that it makes it's in the olive family the oleaceae and so it makes this, these beautiful fruits that hang down and um, look like little olives and the birds go crazy for them, the bigger birds. So pileated woodpeckers, all kinds of songbirds, um, and it's a really cool uh, a, a tree, Cyanthus virginicus. Turns great yellow in the, in the fall and um, again, grows pretty much anywhere on the east coast so it's a it's a tough plant that'll give you a lot of a lot of prettiness but you do need two of them so how would you know well you go to a native plant nursery and you want to see one that has a fruit on it and one that's you really have to ask the the, the plant people because if you buy two males it'll just be pretty but you won't get any fruit so um Cyanthus is good for 75 different species of birds. The bigger ones, the vireos, the, the thrashers, that's a thrasher. And they're kind of cool to watch them eat these, um, these big olive-like fruits. Dogwoods, how can you not get it? love a dogwood? Um, dogwoods get bad rap though, because they wanna be kind of understory trees they want to be on the edge of a meadow or under another tree if you put them on your front lawn and you don't water them they're not going to grow well so you really want to make sure they get enough moisture and they're sited in the right place if they do though look at how beautiful they 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 are um cornice florida so you've got these uh, glossy red clusters of droops that ripen in september to october and they attract bluebirds and thrushes and woodpeckers and they they form a little cluster so when the flower comes out it's that center that aggregate center of, of a bunch of different flowers together and then it's surrounded by these bracts that attract the, the the different insects to pollinate it but it's a great squirrels love it cat birds mockingbirds all kinds of of uh, bigger birds in your in your garden and wonderful fall color and up and down the whole east coast critigus spiritus winter king the hawthorns are 
kind of a little thorny, um, but this is a wonderful one for persistent fruit and for nesting. So here is the hawthorn. It's not that big. It's about as big as a dogwood, maybe 10 feet, and with a spreading kind of nice habit. And it gets little white flowers that then turn into these red, reddish orange fruits. So in the winter, it looks like he decorated it for Christmas. And this particular one is Critigus viridis winter king, the winter king green hawthorn. And because it's kind of twiggy, so many birds like to, to nest in it as well. So this is a win-win-win because you've got the fruits, you got, uh, it also has lovely um, kind of lacy uh, bark that, that is very ornamental. So this is a really nice tree if you can find it. 20 species of bird eat the fruit. And um, like I said, they also like to nest in it. It, it goes maybe all the way, uh, it's native up to Pennsylvania and um, the Great Lakes. But here is a very happy bird going after those fruits. Persimmon. Persimmon is another one of these dioecious plants. So you need a male and a female. Um, and you can see the little golf cart under there. In the old days, this is what they used to make golf clubs out of. Um, it's got kind of a platy bark and it will get pretty tall. Um, it grows a lot around me um, and it's the state tree of Maryland. And we used to have a persimmon festival. I went to University of Maryland, which is kind of hard to have because it's, it, it makes like great fruit roll-ups, but you can make persimmon pie. Um, but you have to wait till after a frost and then it gets soft and gooey and delicious and the birds do love it. So it has male and female trees, like I said, so you wanna plant them together. It has this lovely orange fruit, it's very ornamental. And then after the frost, the birds will go crazy on it. So this is one of those ones that will kind of persist. And you may have it in your yard and you don't know what it is, don't cut it down. It may take a while to flower and fruit, but it's a wonderful tree for the birds. Um, so like we were talking about before, let's try to find these native species because the birds, they don't care what the fruit is. They're just gonna eat it and poop it out and spread it around. And then you've got invasives everywhere. An example is burning bush. If you go to Mount Cuba Center into the woods, the number one problem plant you find is the burning bush. And it's got, you know, these cute little red hanging down uh, berries that the birds love to eat. And so don't use the burning bush. Find a native alternative. This is uh, Euonymus americana, the uh, the native. Uh, it's also called strawberry bush. You know, and you might have to go to a native plant nursery to find it, but it has the most lovely heart-shaped capsules. And um, it is it is wonderful for, for, the, for the birds. They really, really like it. So you want to miss Americana bursting heart, not the most common one, but I always throw a few in that you've never heard of to make you excited and want you want to find them. Um, it's also called the strawberry bush and um, look at all the different birds that that like to eat it. So my point is try not to use an Asian invasive, try to find something that's native and, and the birds will thank you. So here's our Euonymus Americana. Um, Ilex glabra is a good one. It's called the inkberry. Um, and this was, was more for a piney kind of uh, sandy soil. You'll find it in the Pine Barrens. Lots of birds like to eat it um, up and down the whole East Coast. And all of the uh, hollies are really good. It, it, they'll come flocks of robins in December and just like eat every, every berry off the, off the tree. Um, they really like it. There are deciduous hollies. Ilex verticillata is one, the winterberry holly, and the leaves will fall off on this one. You'd normally find it like in a, a, a wet site, like a swampy area. Um, and it's a partial shade one. So this is a, a really good plant. You know, it'll kind of grow anywhere. And the berries persist until the birds eat them off. 
so it's a nice one so it turn yellow and then you have the red berries still on it and then in the winter time um you know until at least december it will persist persist here's one called ilex verticillata winter gold which is a nice one um and it does again they're dioecious they need a male a male and a female plant um, junipers, I've already talked about. They're good. They're it, they're not. You're not going to find them at a nursery, but if you see one coming up in your backyard, let it let it grow, because the birds will eat it, poop it out, and up it'll come. And it's a really good. Uh, there's male and female plants, and 54 different species that will eat it. And it's great for a winter um, a winter plant. Um, spice bush. The deer won't eat that, and so it's pretty common, and it gets a little red berry that um, the thrush really enjoy. Um, you also might get some spice bush caterpillars, and um, turns into the spice bush swallowtail. So again, nice plant to have. Um, if you live at the beach, you might want to plant a bayberry, which smells really good. You can make candles out of it. And it's good for so, for for smaller birds like warblers and chickadees, um, and they love that little fruit. Nissa sylvatica is a cool plant. If you, right about now you'll see the first trees starting to turn like a bright shiny red. Well, Nissa sylvatica is again one of these um, uh, polygamodioecious birds, uh, kind of plants that may be male, might be female female but the the blueberry like fruit make the birds go crazy so viburnums any kind of viburnum is great and they're great for migratory birds overwintering when the insects aren't aren't available there's one called acerifolium which means looks like a maple tree and it does turns pink has lovely black berries um up and down the whole east coast and here's that white sime like flower that it has and um next to the to the maple like leaves that's a good one if you can find it viburnum dentatum is called arrowwood and see how like the the um branches kind of look like arrows you could make um, the native americans used to make arrows on them and like this blue bright blue fruit that the birds go crazy over um, red-eyed vireos, flickers, up and down the East Coast, a good plant to plant. So all of these um, viburnums are good. There's one um, called Wintertour, which is viburnum nudum. And the reason I threw this in here, look at the fruit on it. And here's the flowers. Um, you need more than one for it to set. And possum haw viburnum means um, possum fruit. But look at the color on that thing. It turns pink and blue and the birds go crazy on it. So um, it's a really nice one to, to plant. There's also Viburnum prunifolium. So all the Viburnums are great. They kind of will grow in the shade, produce a lot of fruit and are a benign neglect kind of plant, which gets my vote. Um, this one has eight species. Here's the Viburnum uh, prunifolium in, um, in its fruit. And um, in the winter, it turns like to raisins and will persist. And the little tip mice were, will come out and eat it. All right. So I'm going to end with a couple of uh, just quick shots of my house to say, you can do this. So my bird oasis is important because I can see it. I can look out the window. I can see it every day. So make sure if you plant stuff, you're able to see it and enjoy the birds. You want to have cover and different kinds of layers, shrub layer, tree layer. Um, you want something always in bloom. You want things that will spread naturally, like this Pacora aurea that has little seed-like uh, uh, kind of fairies that blow around and it will spread and the birds like the seeds. Make different kinds of habitat, like I said, a moss garden, a, a, a meadow create all these different layers and you'll get all different kinds of birds add a bench so you can sit on it and enjoy it think about how you're going to get around it in your circulation i'm obsessed with vines because you'll get hummingbirds you'll get all kinds of things hiding in your vines 
um, and put it near the house. This is outside my bedroom so I could see those hummingbirds coming. It can grow up, scramble up a, 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 a downspout. Uh, lots of cover in your in your backyard. Use trees as a screen. And um, the, this is a beautiful Nissel Sovatica that's covered in, in little fruits, a pagoda dogwood. So there's a lot of things that you can plant just as every day that are beautiful that will also attract the birds. This one, the red buckeye, is wonderful for the hummingbirds. That's the one I showed you, the viburnum nudum. So you want to mix them all together and make this beautiful tapestry. Make it a place that you really want to use. Create that outdoor living and imitate habitats so you'll attract as many birds as possible. Make it a, an oasis. You don't need a fancy garden. I just had a string and up came all kinds of stuff. Now, some of it was junk, but I also have wild grape, Virginia creeper, all kinds of pipe vine and things. So you can create this oasis, but the birds will ultimately decide because this is my front door. And in that little pot, I have all these plants. And what happened? A little bird decided to put his nest in my pot. So I made a bird oasis, build it and they will come. So it doesn't have to be big and grandiose. You can just do it in a pot at home. And there he is. He gets mad every time I walk in the front door. So make your yard a bird oasis, plant it and they will come. Okay, I have five minutes for questions. Hi, Eileen. Um, so I have some questions for you. Uh, the first one was, what is the best way to clean a bird feeder? I don't know if you have any tips for that. Um, I just use soap, you know, I'll take soap and water, take it apart every once in a while, especially if I see anything growing on it. Um, things like hummingbird feeders, before I take them down and put them away, I might use a little a bleach and rinse it out really good. But generally, soap and water with a, with a nice brush is, is fine. Okay. Um, you mentioned a handout in the presentation and somebody asked if that was available. I'm not sure if, uh, did you share that with Jean or is that something you can share with me that I can send to people? I shared it with Jean twice. Okay, I will uh, get it from Jean and then I will, anybody that wants it, I'll make sure that they get it. Because all the, all the, the, um, everything I talked about, the genus and the species and the common name, it's just all on there. Okay, yeah, we have other folks other than Master Gardeners that join in, so I'll get it from Jean and share it with anybody that's not oh, part of that Master Gardener group. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a one page list of, you know, the nesting ones, you know, here's, here's what for the, the different fruit and stuff. Okay, uh, the next question I have is, how do you deal with cedar apple rust on service berry? I'm hesitant to spray things, so I haven't planted a service berry in my current garden because of rust. Um, cedar apple rust is a fungus and the, the primary host is a juniper tree. So if you have junipers around, you know, you, you might get it, but it also, has to have the the if you have a lot of rain you know you'll get you'll get these kind of funny little things growing on um, either apple trees anything rosaceous could could get a, like a cedar apple rust so i don't worry about it that much it's not usually something that kills it if it looks bad cut it off you know and try again next year because it's not it's not an every year kind of thing and if you don't have I wouldn't plant them under a juniper tree, but um, I've planted them and, you know, it's nine times out of 10, it's not a problem. Okay. Um, I'm working on planting more native plants in my backyard. If I get bushes that produce berries, are there ones that are not poisonous if my dog gets into them? That's the next question. Uh, that, that you'd have to like, look up on a, on a species to species uh basis if you you know um because different plants are also poisonous to different animals um you know there's there's but there's lots of things like there's a poisonous plant out there called the white snake root and i used to work at the philadelphia zoo and the tortoise came and ate the white snake root and died 
but it was in all the enclosures of all these other plants i I mean other animals and they never ate it they didn't go near it so there's a lot of things in nature that are poisonous but most animals kind of know you know don't have it you know i think a safe thing would be to think about okay i want if i'm going to put a pawpaw and a persimmon and all things that i could eat <laughs> it'll be fine for dogs <laughs> <laughs> okay um i got a comment that this is one of the best speakers i've ever heard so that's a compliment to you eileen thank you <laughs> thank um, you I, I have a good time doing it i wish i could see all your smiling faces but... <laughs> There's another one. Um, somebody else said, "Beyond an excellent talk, one question: Service berry will only will it only grow in wet soil conditions? No, it'll it'll grow in kind of medium, but but if you have like a rocky cliff, it won't. You know, if you just have good garden soil, and you're willing to water it every once in a while, I was just saying naturally you would find it there. But any kind of in in a garden, it'll It'll do really well. Okay, uh, let's see what else. And I do have the handout now and I will make sure that I put my email in the chat so people can email me if they're not part of Jean's Master Gardener group, I can email it to you. Uh, let's see, when collecting seeds, what is the best way to grow them so they become a bush or tree? Um, so you got to know, look, look up the, the particular seed. Certain seeds want to go through a cold period. And, you know, if you leave them outside, they have that. Certain seeds would rather be eaten by a bird and come out the bottom. And then if that's the case, you're going to have to pull off, you're going to have to uh, pull off like the, the fleshy part. Um, some seeds want to get roughed up as they come out that bird's uh, gullet. So you might have to use sandpaper on it. So it's not, you You go online when you find, you know, the plant, say you want a sassafras. Sassafras is our best when they come out of the, uh, a, a bird poops them out. And it, then it's all, all done. But it has a little blue seed. I take the, the all the, the uh, fruit part off. I rough it up and I plant it. Um, but sometimes you, you have to go kind of, it, it might need cold, it might need wet, it might need light. There's lots of things that seeds um, need. So you'll have to look up, look it up specifically. But in general, if you put it outside, it's going to get the everything that it needs and it'll eventually come up. Great. Um, so we have another, let's see. Beautiful pictures and good advice. I appreciate the variety and the correct botanical names. It is always good to know other nature lovers are out there. Oh, nice. Um, we got another thank you from a Fairfax Master Guard. Uh, let's see. Somebody else said, thank you. This was a great introduction for me and really helpful when I go to the native plant sale on Saturday. Oh, good. Buy it out. <laughs> Because you build it and they will come. I I have planted so many things that I was kind of like my pipe vine. I wanted to get pipe vine swallowtails. And they were supposed to be down in, in Virginia, down by you guys, but they're not in New Jersey. So I planted them and I waited for um, about five years. And now I have pipe vine swallowtails. They came. They came from Virginia, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that's all uh, the questions we have for this evening. Um, I d am recording this, or I have been recording this, so I will, um, it will be on the Loudoun County Public Library YouTube channel. I'll also share it with Jean Fenwick, um, who can also share it with the Master Gardener group. Uh, we meet usually once a month online here to talk about a different cool Master Gardener topic, so make sure you check out October's. Um, and thank you, Eileen, for a fantastic presentation. Keep on growing, everybody.